Welcome to Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you, working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Mark Goldman, and I'm the host for Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. I'm really excited to be able to get this interview out to you today. This interview is with Mr. Don Maraca. And if you'd like any more information on his company or his background, you're welcome to check our show notes out. But his story is a great story of what this podcast is all about. Career growth and even more so career evolution and success just overall in your career and your life. Don's story starts out in public accounting like many do, but then life takes him in a different direction. And I think people in public accounting, people in industry, and definitely self-employed individuals can relate to this story. It's a wonderful story of how life sometimes takes you in a different direction, and that ends up being much more fulfilling than anything that you could have ever planned. So let's get started. This is Mr. Don Maronka of San Antonio, Texas. Thanks again for joining us. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on early on is because I find it fascinating the career you've had so far. I mean, people talk about the road less traveled, and you certainly have taken the road less traveled for an accountant. If you don't mind, I mean, if, if you could start off just telling us a little bit about what you do now and how you got there. Sure. Well, now I work with business owners, and I have my own business called JDSM Enterprises, which has a couple components. One is through a franchise called TAB, or the Alternative Board, where I work with the business owners. And then there's another component where I work with the business leaders, so going beyond the business owners, working with their leadership team and really developing a healthy organization, and that's through EOS, the Entrepreneur Operating System. But yeah, it it was quite a journey to to get to where I am now, because I did start in the traditional route of public accounting, where a lot of my colleagues started with my degree, my BBA, and also my master's in professional accounting. Everyone kind of leads towards the public accounting route, which is what I did for five years. Um, but I knew going into it that I would probably just stay there, you know, three to five years before I get my experience and do something else. So it was always part of the plan to get out of public accounting, but that's where I started. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Were you in tax or audit or consulting? I or? was in audit. So I was at Arthur Anderson in audit, and I actually interned with them while I was at school. And then after that, I was with them for another three years. So I went with through four busy seasons with them, uh, and that was in Dallas. And then I went to a smaller regional firm in Austin because I, I found myself drawn back to Austin where I went to school, and I stayed with public accounting there at that firm for a couple of years, and I got into more consulting work. So I mixed it with audit and consulting. But they were former, it was Big 8 back then. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, They were former Deloitte. I know. They were former Deloitte and Touche. And then Deloitte pulled out of the market, but the partners decided to stay in there, so they bought the practice. And I really enjoyed that firm because it was a pretty non-traditional accounting firm, and they were very they were very community oriented, family oriented, and which is what attracted me to them. Because I thought I was done with public accounting when I left Arthur Anderson, but then uh, someone introduced me to to them, so it worked out really well. So I stayed for another two years, so five years in total. Okay. And I can get into my my other steps. There's a lot of other steps before I got to where I am now. <laughs> okay, so I take it you didn't start your business immediately from there. No, I didn't. I, I actually jumped into big corporation work because when I left Dallas, I actually was tired of big companies, and that's why I ended up at a local accounting firm. But then I got, uh, I guess, enticed again to work for big companies, and I ended up at Dell Computers for a little while as a senior finance analyst. And that was interesting because it took me from being the auditor and the one that audits the books to being the one that was being audited. And so I was the one generating the numbers. 
I mean, my numbers were being audited, so I had to speak with auditors. And so that really opened my eyes to the industry world where I can see, you know, how how the numbers came about uh, through the financial statements. And, and, and not as an independent auditor, but more of a, in the, a person that's in the industry. So that was a really great experience for me. And then after okay. that, I ended up at Applied Materials, and that's where I got into more operations and outside of my accounting and finance roles. So it was really, um, again, eye-opening there because I, I looked at the financials uh, more from an operational standpoint, and that's where I got more into um, process improvement and inventory management and all sorts of different things and from a manufacturing standpoint. So, And then from there, I got into small business, and that's really where I found my passion was once I left the big companies, Mm-hmm. Uh, I wore the hats of director of finance and operations because of my my roles of finance and operations in the bigger companies. So I took my experience and kind of wore the hats of director of finance and operations, also CFO, COO roles, working directly with the business owner and small business. And that's where I really felt like I was really called to do, or where I found my passion. And I did that for a few years in those kinds of roles before I ended up buying my own business. So that's that's kind of how I got to the alternative board and now with EOS as well. So it was a long journey, and I always wondered, you know, what uh, what God was preparing me for. But once I found the alternative board and what I'm doing now, it just it made complete sense. He was just kind of grooming me and developing me and my skills because I felt like I was not very deep in a specific expertise or industry, but very wide in business. And I okay. knew the business systems, and I saw different kinds of businesses. And so it really, uh, I think, prepared me to, to work with small business owners and understanding all the different components of business. And I think that's why uh, clients like working with me. Okay. You know what? I, I can understand how the national firm experience to you know large corporate America experience to small corporate America experience help prepare you to do what you do now. But you know, with many people. I talk to taking that leap into self-employment is a big issue, and frequently that's where it stops. You know, they have a dream, but they don't execute on that. What was the motivation behind you deciding to take the plunge? You know, you're, it's scary, especially from, I mean, um, <laughs> being a recovering honest. CPA, because, you know, <laughs> accountants don't take a lot of risks. So, and I, I was wired that way, and as, as I went along my journey in my career, I became less and less risk averse and really wanted to become more entrepreneurial, uh, which you know, as entrepreneurs you know, we take a lot of risks. But I take very calculated risks. So when I journeyed into entrepreneurialism, I really made sure that I had a safety net. <laughs> and so I took I took somewhat of a safe route, although it was still risky, but I bought an existing franchise. And what perpetuated that was, you know, I was I was miserable in my last job, and it really because uh, I'm we moved from Austin to San Antonio, and I took this job down here, knowing there was there was risk that it wasn't it may not work out well because I knew the the I guess the characteristics of the owner, and okay. I knew I would butt heads with the owner a lot, and that's what happened. And eventually, I ended up being asked to leave the company because it wasn't working out. <laughs> and so and that's how a lot of entrepreneurs start is they either lose a job or you know they they feel like they need to do something else because it's just not a fit anymore of what they're doing. And I could have gone back to the corporate world or look for a different job, but then at that point I was just tired of working for other people and I uh, I, I didn't mention that I I got my first entrepreneurial bug in between Dell Computers and Applied Materials, I started my first company, which was an event management company. And I did that for a couple of years. And I did that because I really got burned out of the corporate world when I was working at Dell. And I saw a lot of good people leave. And so I wanted to do something different that would help retain people and develop employees and and really get to the upper management and say, hey, your number one asset is really your employees. So I started doing special events to help retain employees. I mean, it was during the dot-com bubble in the late 90s, and we all know what happened to that bubble. Uh, so it, it burst, <laughs> and so that's, <laughs> that's when I had to go back to the corporate world, and I went to Applied Materials at that point in time. But during that time is when I really got a good taste of entrepreneurship, and I wanted to get back to that. And so when this job didn't work down here in San Antonio, I found myself really analyzing and do some soul searching what I really want to do and what I feel like what God is really calling me to do. 
And so I did a lot of thinking, a lot of praying, a lot of talking to my wife about it. And I thought I, I was being called to go back to, to school and get my PhD in organizational leadership, organizational development, because that's where my passion was. And that was really my main focus when I f- started my first company, was to ex- eventually get to the executive teams and do executive retreats to do leadership development and help them develop their employees so they can retain them. I didn't get to that point before the bubble burst. I was doing more okay. of um, employee appreciation of events and things like that. But uh, it was always in the back of my mind, so I thought maybe it's going back to school was what I was supposed to do. Then I spoke to my wife about it, and it wasn't really in the cards for us at that <laughs> point in time. Since we we just moved down here, and we had we just had our first child, and you know it wasn't the safe thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at Plan B, and that's where I found the alternative board, uh, which is in essence, really about leadership development as well with the business owners. And so I found the franchise, an existing franchise here in San Antonio, and I bought into it. And I felt like that was where I could really study leaders and help them develop and in, in the, at the same time help the local community get, get their businesses operating much better. And so that's kind of how I, I guess, maybe fell into my business, but it's always been in the back of my head to buy my own business. And it just, that job that didn't work out was kind of the springboard to make me do something about it. You know, something you said makes me think of another question. In effect, you became self-employed out of necessity, or that's how the opportunity arose. You know, when you found yourself Mm -hmm. changing jobs, and as you know, I've I've worked with accountants a long time, and frequently we see people become, you know, quote, self-employed, out of necessity. And, you know, some do contract work, some try to build a business, some are successful building a business. And then, you know, unfortunately, some aren't successful in that endeavor. What what do you feel made you successful when out of necessity you became self-employed? Well, for me, because we were pretty new in San Antonio and my network was up in Austin. So I didn't have a network of people here. And so for me, buying an existing business that had a, a existing brand and, and network here was huge for me. So I don't think I would have done it without that kind of infrastructure already in place and without the brand already established. And so that was my safe bet is that, you know, if I can buy an existing business, then I know I'm smart enough to keep it going and to, and to grow it. But if you don't have that kind of network, and especially for typical accountants, they're, we're not really good in sales and marketing, especially in the beginning. And I was I wasn't good at that. Uh, and that that was one of my big eye openers when I first when I started my first business, was that I didn't know how to do business development, sales and marketing, uh, for my event management company. Even though I got some clients, it was a big struggle for me. And if I were to do that again here in San Antonio without a franchise or if I, without an existing brand already, I think it would have been a struggle for me if I were to just start from scratch, especially without a network just being new to San Antonio. Hmm. So does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. And and you work with self-employed CPAs now, correct, in, in EOS and TAP? I do, and that's one of their weaknesses is the business development aspect of it. And a lot of, you know, some of them are able to get new clients really quickly because they buy an existing practice or they buy into an existing practice as a partner. And that works out well for a little while, but then they're challenged with getting new clients in, and sometimes that becomes a challenge as um, – as a practicing CPA because, you know, the easy, the comfortable work is doing the preparation, the tax preparation, the audits and things, the technical stuff. And it's not, and it makes them uncomfortable going out of the office and doing the business development stuff. So how do you help a newly self-employed CPA build up that skill? What advice do you give them? What tools would you recommend or how would you help them in that area? Well, at first I try to understand what they're really, really good at and, and build their confidence because what... Their hesitation is, you know, they don't like to talk about themselves. And so what I, what I try to do is, you know, really try to hone in what, what their value is, what they, what they bring to the table, because they're valuable. Their, their expertise is valuable. And really focus on that instead of feeling like a sales pitch or a sales, sales conversation. Just really talk about their expertise and really get to know their clients well and what their needs are. 
and then it's not sales; it's just more relationship building, and that's that's really what they're doing. Is and most of their clients come through relationships, and that's what's important in selecting a CPA is the relationship. So it's really just feeling comfortable with what they offer and really understanding the client needs. So that's what I try to do, and and that's the same goes for a lot of the businesses. And that's what I'm doing now with EOS is part of the EOS process, the entrepreneur operating system is getting clear on the vision and the vision has eight questions and the first two are what are your core values? So what do you stand for? Who are you? You know, what are you about? And then the second question is what what is your core focus? And that's really your purpose, cause, or passion. That's one component of it. And then the other component is your niche. What is your niche? Because that's one of the things I think also as entrepreneurs, including myself, is that we try to cast a too wide of a net and, and and you've experienced this too, Mark, yourself. But we don't clearly define our niche, so we, we end up really spreading our resources too thin and diluting our message because people don't understand what we're about and what what we stand for and why we're doing things. And I think when you hone that in, as any entrepreneur, whether it's a CPA trying to establish a practice or any business owner, if those two focus, then it makes it a lot easier to communicate your message and they, they understand you. Or if y'all ever heard the, the Simon Sinek TED Talk, Start With Why, he talks about, you know, people don't do business with you because of what you provide or how you do it. It's because of why you do it. They, they want to understand your purpose or your cause, your passion. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to play devil's advocate here a little bit. So sure. a tax return is a tax return. A financial statement is a financial statement. I mean, if I can do a tax return for a doctor, I can certainly do a you know, tax return for a welding shop or tax return for another service business. What What is the benefit to narrowing down my customer base? Well, you can, but then you're just like any other CPA practice, and you really don't stand out because if – and you're basically commoditizing your service, and if you're a commodity, all you have to deal with is price. You, you just compete on price. And if you want to compete on price, that's fine. But if you want to compete more on value – and if you are more valuable to them because you have a certain expertise in a niche, then people are willing to pay more for that. And if they understand why you're doing that and what your connection is to their specific industry and that you can add more value beyond just preparation, then that's where you want to be. You don't want to compete just based on a commodity and just based on price. I totally agree. I think that as well, then you become the sought-out subject matter expert, you know, the, the deeper you go with that niche. Would you right, agree? absolutely. I agree. And and some of the things I do, I mean, my focus is on business owners and leadership teams with a certain amount of employees and revenues. And even now, I'm I'm starting to look at my entry niche because, and we do that kind of more indirectly because when we do our marketing campaigns, we know there's certain SIC codes mm-hmm. that are not ideal for the alternative board and even uh, EOS. They're just not good fits. We've had experience with them. And it's typically not uh, the, the kind of psychographic that we're looking for, uh, psychographic meaning really what they value and how they think, how they make decisions. And so we have a, a certain filtering mechanism, and we're looking at our ideal customer as well for TAB and EOS. You know, I find in my own career that many accountants have it in their back of their mind that eventually someday they want to be self-employed. So if, if I'm sitting in my job right now and I have that dream, what one piece of advice or what few things should I be thinking about before starting my business? Well, I mean, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is your your network. I mean, your network is gold, especially if you're starting your own practice. If you if you don't have a network right now and outside of your own work, you need to develop that so that once you leave and if when you do leave, you have a network already established that you can go to. You can tell them what you're doing now. And another thing is really... Uh, and I, it may sound a little cliche, but it's true. You know, really doing your best where you're at and learning as much as you can as possible along the way. Because if I hadn't done that, uh, where because I, I never knew where I was heading. Because <laughs> three years was kind of the max I <laughs> I ended up in one company or one position. Doors would close, doors would open, and I I try to do my best wherever I was. And because of that, I was able to hone in a bunch of skills and and experiences and talents and gifts. That that's, that's allowed me to do what I do now, and so I think you're there for a reason, and so really absorb as much as you can and do your best because when you do your best, doors open. 
And when you're learning as much as possible along the way, then you can use that knowledge elsewhere. Those are probably the two main things, is really build your network and then do your best and learn as much as you can along the way. Wonderful. Well, we're sort of coming up to the end. I have three final questions that I want to ask you. But first, I want to make sure that the audience understands, you know, what TAB is and EOS. Is there anything else you'd like to say about that business? Because I know we've talked a lot about your accounting career, and we really haven't talked about that that consulting (laughs) side too much yet. (laughs) Um, No, I appreciate that. No, I'd I'd be happy to. So my company, uh, the parent company is called JDSM Enterprises, and it operates uh, TAB and EOS. So what I do is really help develop healthy businesses. And uh, what I mean by that is really providing a lot more wisdom to the owners and the, and the leadership team so that they're operating out of really good, wise counsel and good proven processes that's been around for years. And because of that, it helps facilitate change, uh, change in the organization, which moves you forward. And from there, you have more peace of mind knowing that you're, you're operating in a more healthy fashion as a business. So it's really, I help change business lifestyles to be more healthy business lifestyles. And I do that through the alternative board, which is more for the owners. And that's through peer boards, which is basically mastermind groups for business owners and also coaching, business coaching one-on-one with those owners. And through EOS, I work with their leadership team by meeting with them in full day sessions throughout the year, helping them implement this entrepreneur operating system so that their vision is crystal clear and they're gaining traction towards that vision, executing really well, and so they're, they're functioning as a healthy team. So that's that's what I do. In a nutshell, I mean, the, the benefit for that all that is really just building value for the company because most of these companies, the owners have to exit at some point in time or transition leadership at some point in time. And when you have a well-run company, it adds value to the organization uh, whether or not you, you sell it in the long run to an independent or to your, your employees or whoever the case may be, because at some point in time, it's it's going to have to transition. And I help them build the value so that when it does transition, they get what they want out of it. It seems like no matter what you talk about these days, you eventually talk about succession planning and exit strategy. It's, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a fact yeah. of the business world that we live in. <laughs> That's right. Especially these days with baby boomers, a lot of them are retiring. So. Yeah. All right. Well, final three questions. Number one, and this this can be in relation to your career or, or just in relation to life in general, but what has been your proudest moment? Wow, my proudest. I have to pick one. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> what if I had a That's personal and a business? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Personal and business. Fair enough. My proudest moment. I guess personally, I got married late in life. So I got married almost 34 years old and so did my wife. And I guess my uh, my proudest moment was not settling because I almost gave up on on getting married and oh. I, I almost settled and you know chased after you know girls that I thought would be marriage material but then you know it, it wasn't working out so I almost gave up on marriage but then I met my wife at the age of 32 so I'm very proud to uh, you know not settle. Um, because I found my my soulmate and my my best friend and my rare find so that's. My proudest moment for the personal side and then on the business side would be, I guess it was a time when I stood up to the owner of a company when I was a director of finance and operations for a training organization. I just didn't feel like he was being led the right way by some consultants, which had a lot of influence. And I stood up against the consultants and I told the owner, you know, I don't think you need them anymore. And they threatened to sue me and they, and they really went after me pretty hard. And uh, I didn't feel the support of the owner, so I, I resigned. But I had, I guess I had enough influence at the organization that the organization kind of went up in uproar, and all the employees said, you got to hire Don back, and you got to fire these consultants because we agree wow. with them. Yeah. And so <laughs> the day after my resignation, the owner came back to me and said, would you come back? So I went back. They fired the consultants. He fired the consultants. And I went on another two years with the that business and helping them grow I mean, really helping develop his culture. And, and it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And I knew my team had my back and that was a great feeling. To me, that's probably one of my proudest career experiences. Wow. That's a good story. Yeah. For the flip side, I guess, tell us about a mistake you've made and what you learned from it 
And frankly, the more colossal, the better. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was easy. It's kind of the opposite of standing up to the owner. So when I when I took this job, I'm going back to the job in San Antonio that didn't work out. And so when I took this job in San Antonio, I mentioned to you I moved my family down here. I also moved my wife's mom and sister and grandmother down here who live next door to us. So we built houses down here, and we just had a child. And so this really, you know, hits home when when people are faced with a lot of different things that put a lot of pressure and requirements on your income. (laughs) You do a lot of things that are not, I guess, you're challenged with your values because of that. And so when I was willing to stand up to the owner in my previous role, you know, it was a lot riskier to stand up to the owner in my current situation back then, just out of fear that, you know, the job may not work out and what happens and my income disappears. And so I was willing to put up with a lot of things that really were a counter to my values. And so I felt like my integrity was was really being washed away and my spirit was being broken. So it was it was something that if I had to change that time of what I did, it, w- it would be get rid of the fear and, and, and be my self and really stand up to the owner because I think I would have served that owner much better um, even if we disagreed on things but I was willing to take a lot of things that I wouldn't have in the past if I was in a different situation to me that was a failure on my part for not standing up for what's right and it affected the organization and affected my relationship with the owner and I would do that differently next time I think all of us have a point in life where we learn that lesson, and unfortunately, we have to learn it the hard way. So I think that's a pretty common experience. Now, I would say it's a failure, but also it also led me to what I do now. So I I think it was really a launching point and a critical point in my my career to really, I think, having to experience it, it made me, it steered me in the path where I am now. So I don't regret that. But I would de- still definitely do it differently. Yes, yes. Actually, it, make, it probably makes you more valuable to, to your uh, clients now <laughs> to have been through that. Yeah, uh, I never thought about it that way, but you're right. Last question. We, we call this podcast Life in Accounting because although it's related to the accounting profession, it's about life. So what one mm-hmm. piece of advice about life would you like to leave our audience with? Well, I think it kind of goes back to what I said already is, you know, throughout your career, you may be doing things that you don't necessarily want to do, and you may question whether or not you're in the right place at some point in time, or if it's worth it doing what you're doing. I would say, you know, where you are, always do your best and learn as much as you can along the way, because you never know what doors are going to open, and you want to keep those relationships strong regardless of where you are. And I think that's what's made me successful, is I've never... I never burn bridges, and I always leave, even if it's an uncomfortable situation, I always leave the door open, and I, I exit gracefully, and I do my best knowing that my time might might be short wherever I am. So I, I think if any of the listeners are going through some kind of transition, you know, it's not the time to slack off <laughs> and, and burn bridges. <laughs> That's really the most important time to really show what you can do, and you never know what doors are going to open for you. I, I totally agree. I, I find that no matter what your situation is, you rarely can go wrong by doing a good job for somebody. Yes. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining us once again for the Life in Accounting, the Where Accounts Go podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time out today, Don, and and I wish you success on all your endeavors. <laughs> thank you so much. I enjoyed it, and uh, thanks for letting me share my life and my my career. You're very welcome. Have a great day. Thanks, Mark. Well, I hope you were able to take away some words of wisdom or just insight into your own career. Don is a a very sharing individual, and I appreciate how much he opened up to us in this particular interview. Before you leave, please don't forget to look at our supporters for the Where Accountants Go website. We have many advertisers, and we very much appreciate them. And also, please don't forget to tune in next time to Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. There's more to come.